A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, In your vision, O king, you saw a statue, very large and exceedingly bright, terrifying in appearance as it stood before you. The head of the statue was pure gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs bronze, the legs iron. Its feet partly iron and partly tile. While you looked at the statue, a stone, which was hewn from the mountain without a hand being put to it, struck its iron and tile feet, breaking them in pieces. The iron, tile, bronze, silver, and gold all crumbled at once, fine as the chaff on the threshing floor in summer, and the wind blew them away without leaving a trace. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, the interpretation we shall also give in the king's presence. You, O king, are the king of kings. To you, the God of heaven has given dominion and strength, power and glory. Men, wild beasts, and birds of the air, wherever they may dwell, he handed over to you, making you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom shall take your place, inferior to yours. Then a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the whole earth. There shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. It shall break in pieces and subdue all of these others, just as iron breaks in pieces and crushes everything else. The feet and toes you saw, partly of potter's tile, and partly of iron, mean that it shall be a divided kingdom, but yet have some of the hardness of iron. As you saw the iron mixed with clay tile, and the toes partly iron and partly tile, the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. The iron mixed with clay tile means that they shall seal their alliances by intermarriage, but they shall not stay united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the lifetime of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. He shall never be destroyed nor delivered up to another people. Rather, it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and put an end to them, and it shall stand forever. That is the meaning of the stone you saw hewn from the mountains without a hand being put to it, which broke in pieces the tile, iron, bronze, silver, and gold. The great God has revealed to the king what shall be in the future. This is exactly what you dreamed, and its meaning is sure. The word of the Lord. Give glory and eternal praise to him. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Angels of the Lord, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. You heavens, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. All you waters above the heavens, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. All you hosts of the Lord, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever.
Dominus Fobiscum. Et un spiritu tuo. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Gloria Tibi Domine. While some people were speaking about how the temple was adorned with costly stones and votive offerings, Jesus said, All that you see here, the days will come when there will not be left a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. Then they asked him, Teacher, when will this happen? And what sign will there be when all these things are about to happen? He answered, See that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has come. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for such things must happen first, but it will not immediately be the end. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famines, and plagues from place to place, and awesome sights and mighty signs will come from the sky. Verbum Domini. In our first reading today, we hear of the audience between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. And to give the context of this reading, the king had been experiencing very troubling dreams. And he had summoned all of his advisors, including sorcerers, magicians, and enchanters. And he told them not only to interpret his dream, but he also wanted them to reveal what the contents of the dream were itself. So these advisors offered to interpret the dream if he would tell them what the dream was, and then they could get together and try to come up with a good interpretation. But he demanded that they prove their supernatural power, which they claimed, by being told, uh, again, by telling him not only the interpretation, but the contents of the dream. And understandably, they could not do this. In fact, they said to him, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing as of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and none can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. This did not persuade the king to reveal to them what his dream had been. In fact, it made him furious, and he demanded that all of his advisors be executed because they couldn't tell him what his dream was. And we know, as we heard in yesterday's reading, Daniel and his companions had just been promoted to be the king's servants, and so they were included in this bunch of advisors that were gonna be executed. And so when the king's guard came to Daniel and he found out why he was going to be killed, he immediately said, well, let's set up an appointment with the king and I'll let him know the interpretation of it. And in the meantime, he went with his companions. He told them to pray along with himself. Let's pray to God, asking him for his mercy and for his help. And as we know from scripture, from Daniel chapter 2, the Lord did reveal to Daniel what the king's dream was and its correct interpretation what God was trying to explain through this dream. So Daniel, when he did go, when was, the meeting was set up with the king, he did explain this to the king, and he used this as an opportunity to give glory and credit to God. He could have easily taken credit for himself. I'm thinking of a similar, perhaps, there, may have, there could have been a temptation with John the Baptist. Remember, when he was preaching, everyone was going to him saying, are you the Christ, are you the Messiah? And he gave credit to the Lord. He said, no, there's one coming after me. Perhaps it could have been a similar temptation with Daniel. He could have taken credit for himself, but he said, 
Daniel, in fact, told the king, there is no wise man on earth who could reveal what the king had demanded. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known these things. So then Daniel explained the dream and its interpretation to the king, which we heard in today's reading. In the image of a statue made of various materials, it represented, as we heard, four different kingdoms. And a mysterious stone, which was cut out from a mountain by no human hand, struck the feet of the statue, and it came crumbling apart. And the stone is the kingdom of God that would be established and would endure forever. So we can see the statue again, not only as representing four kingdoms, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom, but also as the false pagan worship that these kingdoms promoted, and that the kingdom of God would bring an end to them. So this account has been seen as a prophecy concerning Christ. St. Augustine put it, as he put it, we know that the stone cut from the mountain without hands is Christ, who came from the kingdom of the Jews without human father. The stone that shattered all the kingdoms of the earth, all the tyrannies of idols and devils, the stone that grew and became a great mountain and filled the whole world. And this passage has not only been seen as a prophecy concerning Christ, but also a prophecy concerning the coming of the church. St. Augustine said further regarding the church that it is that mountain which, according to Daniel's vision, grew from a very small stone till it crushed the kingdoms of the earth and grew to such a size that it filled the face of the earth. So we see in this reading again a prophecy concerning Christ and the church, but also we see in Daniel a model and example of humility, right? Again, because he, in this moment that the Lord raised him up, he gave credit to the God of heaven, the one true God. And it fits perfectly with the responsorial psalm today. Give glory and eternal praise to him. And that's what Daniel did. And then if we look at today's gospel today, we hear that some were admiring how impressive the temple looked in Jerusalem. And our Lord took that opportunity to explain to them and to speak about its coming destruction and about the end of time. Now, the temple was a very impressive sight. Herod the Great had adorned it with massive white stones, and the facade of the sanctuary was covered in gold. And it's noted that many of its stones measured nearly 40 feet in length, so it was massive. And disciples pressed the Lord after he foretold its coming destruction asking when all this would take place. And he didn't give them an exact date because he wanted them and he wants us to always be vigilant, to always be ready. We know that the temple would be destroyed in 70 AD, but we still await his second coming. And he wants us to be prepared and not to be caught off guard when that time comes, when he calls us. And he says also in today's gospel, see that you are not deceived. So he warns about false teachers and false messiahs, that is, anyone who would lead others astray from God. And St. Athanasius tells us that one great gift that our Lord gave us to protect us from being deceived is the word of God itself, is sacred scripture. You can think of the line from Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And St. John Chrysostom likewise referred to the books of the Bible as medicine for the soul and as a constant teacher Referring to the books of the Bible, St. John Chrysostom said, if you encounter grief, dive into them as into a chest of medicines. Take from them comfort for your trouble, whether it be loss or death or bereavement over the loss of relations. Don't simply dive into them, swim in them. Keep them constantly in mind. The cause of all evils is the failure to know the scriptures well. Right? It's the truth. It's God revealing himself, revealing the truth to us. The Lord also warns about wars and insurrections that will precede the last days. But he says, don't be terrified, right? for such things must happen. They must take place. We are not to be alarmed, but to take heed and to be prepared. So what are we called to do simply? To keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus. He is our strength. He is our peace. And he will assist us. He'll strengthen us with the grace that we need. And it's also very good and helpful for us to ask for the grace of final perseverance. 
In light of Christ's teaching that wars will come and precede the last days, St. Ambrose says that there are also other wars which the Christian wages, the struggles of different lusts and the conflicts of the will. And domestic foes are far more dangerous than foreign. So it's a reminder that we're in a constant struggle, right? A constant spiritual battle. And if we want Christ to reign in our hearts, as we just celebrated the feast of Christ the King, we want him to be the king of every aspect of our lives. If we want Christ to reign in our hearts and to get to heaven, we've got to fight, right? By prayer and by the help of God's grace, struggling against the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our Lord said very clearly that he who perseveres to the end will be saved. Again, we ask him for the grace of final perseverance.